at this time, I'm okay. going to turn it over to you and we'll give you a full screen. I hope Scott can do that mm -hmm. to us for us and everybody else, please mute. And we'll wait till the end of Dick's presentation to ask questions if you would. Okay. So Dick, go ahead. If you can. Hey hear everyone. Uh, I'm Dick Dragowitz. And uh, I've met and talked with some or maybe all of you over time at different uh, Lee Wolf functions and activities like that. And then maybe perhaps I've seen you at a fishing show or maybe on stream or even uh, maybe at one of Bob Olak's fly tying sessions for his favorite soft tackle patterns. And so we've, we've probably met. I want to compliment the uh, Lee Wolf chapter on all of its uh, conservation work, the stream work you do the style programs you put together, and this Trout in the Classroom. You've done terrific that way. And you've funded these activities and other stuff also. And in fact, you've made contributions to the coalition to save the Menominee River, and we appreciate that. In addition, you've helped us when we needed some opposition correspondence sent out to uh, the state of Michigan and other places to support our activity in opposing this proposed mine. So thank you. So like you, uh, Scott, are we ready for a slide there? Yeah, if you can, do you want to try sharing your screen or should I run it off mine? You can run it off yours because I couldn't figure out how to do it before, so. <laughs> okay. So, so we're going to start with the, it's the first one is the uh, Lee Wolf uh, logo sign and which you all know about there. And so that's part of that one. So the next one is going to be the uh, slide that shows the logo for the coalition to save the Menominee River. There you go. Cool. The system's working. So, uh, excuse me. I, go on. If, if everybody uh, looks in the upper right hand corner, you can click on speaker view and you'll get a lot bigger picture. So. Uh -huh. All right. So, anyway, uh, I'm a volunteer with the Coalition to Save the Menominee River. I'm also a member of the Gary Borger TU chapter and NIFTY. And I participate in activities of different TU chapters doing a variety of things over time. You know, I've done stream work uh, in Wisconsin. I've gone and participated with Wisconsin River Alliance on doing cleanup of the Milwaukee River and a variety of things. So I'm doing the same stuff you are and just in a different place at a different time. Tonight, I'd like to talk to you about the Menominee River and how it's being threatened by the proposed uh, metallic sulfide mine. Uh, Mark, or Mark, uh, Scott, could we change that slide to that river scene then? And then it's a little slow to advance. Oh, my PowerPoint is too slow. I could no, it's probably my computer. I got to talk to Microsoft. Uh, anyway, there we go. So this is the uh, Menominee River. This is downstream of the McAllister Bridge, and McAllister Bridge is um probably 10 miles east of wasaki if you're familiar with the area and wasaki is probably 10 miles north of Krivitz, just as a point of reference so you can see the structure there so it houses a lot of bass and this is one of my favorite spots to fish there was this launch at McAllister and going up to the dam and then floating downstream for mysterious distances so it's terrific so I've been doing this uh, conservation stuff to protect the Menominee River for about 12 years now. And it started, uh, my introduction to the Menominee River came about in 2006. And one of, my, one of my brothers called and he said, I'm going to Green Bay, Wisconsin for a business trip. Can we fish that Saturday and Sunday? I said, sure, I'll figure something out. And as I flippantly say now, the only thing I knew about uh, Green Bay was that they had a football team and I could find it on a map. So to find out where to go fishing, I called Milwaukee and talked to my friend Dave Pinchkowski, who's a fishing, Wisconsin fishing guide, and I explained the scenario to him. And I says, where do we go? What do we do? Dave immediately responded and he says, let's go fish the Menominee River. It's got terrific smallmouth bass fishing. I said, okay. We worked out logistics and uh, accommodations and all that good stuff there. And then we met him there a couple weeks later and we fished on that Saturday and Sunday on the Menominee River. We launched both days at the same place called Bear Point, 
which is on the way to this McAllister Bridge site. And it's a public access place there. So we fished that and the fishing and the catching was terrific. And so we had a great time and we had lots of BS, of course, that goes along with this stuff. And uh, it all helps out. Uh, can we have a, a, the next, next slide there, which is a map? So this will give you an idea where things are. And I don't know if my cursor shows up on your screen or not, but if you look up in that box on the right, you can see the Menominee River flows into Lake Michigan here, and it starts farther up here in Iron Mountain where the couple rivers come together and they flow or they meet up and it forms the headwaters of the Menominee. So this is a 114 mile river where the Green Star is there is the proposed mine site and that's 44 river miles upstream of where it flows into Lake Michigan. So on the way home from that trip, I was talking to myself because I always get good answers. And I was saying, I should be fishing the Menominee River some more. So uh, I didn't fish it that summer, but the next summer, 2007, myself and Dave and some friends would go up there for weekends or days in the middle of the week and we'd fish and it was always really good. And then toward the end of that summer, I started seeing some signs that said, stop the mine. Next slide there. That should be stop the, the mine sign. And so, I, whoops, this is the brotherly trip here. So let me hang on to this one for a second. So uh, we fished and we did this, and I, these are pictures taken by my brother and shared with me. So you can tell this is him on the right. And so he's got the big fish and I've got the small fish, but that's okay. And this is Dave, uh, who's uh, the fishing guide there. So Dave, you can see his hairstyle there, a little sidelight to this. He's also created some fly patterns, one of which is called the bad hair day. And you can see why it's called the bad hair day from his hairdo there. Let's go on to the next slide. So on that uh, second summer, I see this sign like this and I says, what's this all about? Nobody's got an answer. So I just, the ends of summer and then we jump ahead to the next year. And then so in 2008, I'm doing the same thing and I'm seeing more signs along the highways and along in front of houses on the river. And so I just keep asking around. And I finally found the source of the sign and it was a group called the Front 40. And the Front 40 is a play on the words of the name of the mine, which is the Back 40. And originally the mine started out, it was going to be like a 40 acre site and they were gonna find some gold and silver and other things to make a couple people wealthy. So I made arrangements to meet Ron and Carol Hendrickson that formed this Front 40 group and have them explain to me what the mining's all about. They did, and I said, well, maybe I can help you. And I was thinking of this from a totally selfish standpoint because the fishing was so good that I didn't want it damaged or destroyed by somebody's mine. So I teamed up with them and I started doing some stuff. I would put up some signs when I was up there, I'd go to their meetings that they arranged and talk to people and express my concerns about this, the safety and protection of the river and some related stuff. I also made some don financial donations to them. And then over time, I started raising funds to help them out. So we evolved along. So from that point in time until about 2015, Akila, re next slide then please. Aquila Resources, uh, woo, I'm getting myself out of context here. So this is an access thing. This, I should have showed you this for that, for fishing. So this is an access site at the uh, McAllister Bridge. And the next sign, uh, slide, sorry, shows you uh, Dave launching his boat. And this boat here is what he calls a jet sled. And it's designed to travel in a little bit of water. If he's got 10 or 12 inches of water, everything is cool. This uh, outboard motor is a jet drive, so it doesn't suffer from propeller destruction from all the structure that we showed you in that first scenery photo. And this is 18 foot of boat, and I thought this was a really good boat until Dave started adding accessories to it that got it cluttered. But uh, when it was, and this was relatively new in this picture, and so it didn't have all that stuff, so it had space, it was really nice. It was the best fishing boat I've been in. Next slide. 
And then so you can fish this thing in any way you want. You can uh, use flies like this Murdoch minnow here, or you could use live bait. You can use plastics on a spinning rod or lures on a casting rod. And whatever way you want, it's going to work and you're going to catch fish. My preference is uh, a fly rod. And when I go fishing, I'll rig up two rods, a six weight fly rod for poppers and Mr. Wigglies and things that float on the surface. And an eight weight rod for lures that have some weight such as clausers, crayfish patterns and things of that nature. And they all, they all seem to work. You can do whatever you want out there and it's pretty good. Now a little sidelight to this is that uh, some days the fish get a little finicky. And so I uh, purchased a spinning rod and some plastics that I use. And when the fish get a little finicky like that, or when it gets windier than my casting skills can handle. So that's another option there. Next slide, please. So back to the map again. So this shows you again where the mine site is, that little green star in both of those boxes. Let's put it up there like that. Next slide. So Aquila Resources is the company that wants to build this. They're a Canadian company headquartered in Toronto, Ontario. And uh, they control this site and some additional land. And they also have some land in Wisconsin in a couple places. Now, th this is their plan, what they want to do. You can look in the, like the center of this is in number one. This is going to be the open pit underground portion of the mine. So this surface area of this 750 foot deep hole is uh, about 100 acres in size. This is comparable to a regional shopping center such as Oak Brook Center or Woodfield Mall or other comparable malls in the area. That puts that in perspective that way. To the right of that is number two. And this is, I think, out of scale here because they're saying uh, the tailings management facility is, another, is going to be a man-made dam and that's 124 acres in size. So it's about 25% bigger than the, the mine pit itself. So the Aquila has been relatively quiet from, was it relatively quiet from the early 2000s until 2015 when they uh, filed for a mine permit application. They filed that and they got issued in 2016 and they filed for a couple others. So they've gotten four permits issued. All of these permits have substantial conditions that need to be satisfied before anything can happen. So one of these is uh, under litigation. It was the wetlands permit. And I'll talk about the litigation when we get farther on here. The uh, proposed mine covers a thousand acres, a little over a thousand acres, and that equates to 1.7 square miles and put things in perspective. So if you go to Chicago's Loop and you start at Roosevelt Road and the river, follow the river north all the way up to then where it makes that right turn, eastern, easterly turn, and it empties out, or not it doesn't empty out because it flows in, is it uh, meets up with Navy Pier and then come back down the coastline. That'll be the size of this mine site, which is pretty big. I mean, it's just like disasters. And you can also see where that number 12 is on that map. That's the distance there is 150 feet from the edge of that pit to the river, danger zones. So we don't want that to happen. And so what we're doing is everything we can to stop it. Let's go to the next one. So a couple things happen with dams. This picture here was taken in late January of 2019 in Brazil. I mentioned this 124 acre tailings dam a moment ago. Tailings dam have a tendency to collapse. This one collapsed in Brazil in 2019 and 270 people were killed. Others were injured and the, the environment was really damaged bad. And this will probably be damaged like forever because it's hard to clean this stuff up. Next slide. 
And this is more of the damage and destruction from this. So this one had like, was twice, this tailings dam here was twice as big as the one on the Menominee River, which you can see this here. And then the third slide shows what happens when people get killed. They get carried, next slide please, I'm sorry. So they're carrying off bodies from the, this site here. So if this was to happen on the Menominee, you've got 44 river miles to take it to Lake Michigan and all of this would get contaminated in some fashion. Now this whole thing may not collapse, but it may partially collapse. And so then you have other issues like that. So it's not healthy. And uh, we're trying to convince the state of Michigan, their department to call the Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. And the acronym for that is EGLE, referred to as EGLE. And so uh, we're trying to convince them that the style of tailings dam that Aquila wants to use isn't safe. There are other methods of doing this, which turn out to be much more expensive. And so Aquila's process project is marginally profitable at best. So if they have to incur bigger dollars, they may cancel out the whole program. And so that's one of our thoughts. Next slide. So after this uh, disaster in Brazil, and the year before that, there was also another disaster in Brazil uh, of a slightly smaller size where like 20 people died, others were injured, and 400 miles of river and rivers were damaged and permanently contaminated because the tailings material flowed all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. There are pictures from the satellites and from the space station showing this flowage going down there and doing that. So back to the 2019 issue, shortly afterwards, the investment arm of the Church of England and other in international investors that had of a portfolio, and you can see at the top of the screen, that's $13 trillion with a T, not a B. So that's like, they've got serious influence. So they started doing a little analysis, not a little, substantial analysis on what makes, dam what makes mining safe or unsafe. And so they were looking to protect their investments in mines and mining companies. And so they did this study and uh, it's it had been published now. Simultaneously, the mining trade organizations and mining companies got together and did a similar study. Their purpose was a little bit different than the uh, Church of England's group in that they wanted to show the investment community that mines could be safe and that they know how to do this because they need investor money. Without investor money, they're handicapped. They can't do anything. So both of these groups have published reports and have shared them with the world and a couple other entities have done similar things and nothing's really happened yet, but we're making some progress and that people are paying attention and that in the mining industry, the top of the concerns when they talk about issues is mine safety and tailing stands. Now there's a mining engineer that we know and have used at the coalition for other work, for related work to this, and that he says that the only safe tailings dam is the one that isn't built. So this is a concern that the world has. And I think the mining industry is uh, focusing on this now. So that's uh, some positive stuff that's happening there. Now we've taken this information about the collapse of the dam and these studies put out by the Church of England and the mining groups like this. And we've shared this with Eagle again, the, the, the group at the state of Michigan that reviews these mine permits. So we keep them informed on lots of things and hopefully it'll work and uh, they'll pay attention and do something sensible. Next slide, please. Doing something sensible is uh, not permitting the mine. Mines also have another issue. It's called acid mine drainage. Now this picture is from a, a stream out in Montana. And so this is acid mine drainage here. And when a mine, the, the mine in, um, on the Menominee River 
the ore there has sulfide in it. When sulfide gets mixed with the air and water, it creates sulfuric acid and it becomes what they call acid mine drainage. And it's just like this picture here. So if this acid mine drainage gets into the river, those smallmouth bass that you and I like to catch and release, they won't be there. They'll all be dead. So we need to find ways to, again to stop this mine. Aquila says they have ways of protecting the, the water from all these things here. But when asked to demonstrate or show another mine, sulfide mine anywhere in the world that has in contaminated water, they go home and they, because they can't answer the question. Next slide, please. So one of the other things that the coalition and others have done is uh, we've gone to court. This is the courtroom that heard the issue on the wetlands permit. And uh, we're waiting for a decision on this and for reasons that we don't know and don't really wanna ask because delays are good and that uh, the judge hasn't made a decision yet. And so this case involved uh, the state of Michigan, Aquila, the mining company, and the coalition teamed up with the Menominee Indian tribe of Wisconsin and the family that owns the land contiguous to the north side of the mine site. So there were 19 days of testimony and I attended some of that. And it's amazing how much detail and how many fine questions, minute questions people can ask about all this stuff there and how much detail exists. The exhibits to this thing is probably a stack of books eight or nine feet high. And so it's a lot of material and maybe that's why this judge can't, hasn't made a decision yet because there's so much of it. Next slide. A couple weeks ago, the EPA did something good that uh, they haven't been known to do here in the last couple of years. So the, there's an area called the Lower Menominee River Area of Concern. This is like the first three miles upstream of where it meets the lake. And this, this site was contaminated from government usage of water and sewage and uh, businesses that polluted things. There's a company called Tyco now called Johnson & Johnson, and uh, they produce uh, flame retardant materials and uh, the toxic materials to put out fires. So they contaminated all this. So over a 30 year period of time, $200 million was spent to clean up this site. And it's been completed now, and so it's been delisted from one of these nasty sites, this area of concern. So. Our thinking is that, and we've shared this again with the, the Eagle folks, is that if the mine is built, it's going to contaminate the river, and we've just wasted $200 million. Why would we want to do that? So we keep marching on. Next slide, please. Toward the end of the completion of that uh, EPA delisting there, there was another program that was completed. It's called the Lake Sturgeon Passage Program. It cost $12 million and was completed two years ago. The pur purpose of this program is to uh, enable sturgeon to move upstream of the dams on the Menominee River for growth and spawning purposes. So the, the program, or this, pat, this program here, uh, has two features to it. One is there's an elevator at the first dam upstream of the lake, and the uh, the sturgeon can be captured in the elevator, lifted over the dam, and let go upstream. In addition, the, the elevator has a little cage area effect to it, and they can scoop out the sturgeon and put them in tanker trucks and take them farther upstream beyond other dams. There's, this river's got five power generating dams spaced out over 60 or 70 miles. So that's the plan there. And when they uh, capture these sturgeon to do this year, they put tags on them so they can track them. So one of the first sturgeon that was moved upstream in this program here had these tag on it, and it was taken way upstream, maybe like 50 miles. And two or three days later, it was found in the Peshtigo River, which is about 30 miles west of the mouth of this river here. So this fish knew where it wanted to go. 
and it just migrated all the way down. I thought that was kind of an interesting story here. Part of the program, in addition to ways of lifting them over, they've got troughs so that the fish can get past the dams without getting chewed up by the power generating stuff. Next slide. This is a little colorful picture of a sturgeon, a little more artsy than the other one. I, I just like that one because it had color to it. Next slide, please. So climate change is a big issue. All the calculations done for this mine operation, projected mine, uh, have been based on weather standards that are 15 to 20 years old and are identified as 100 year weather patterns. We all know climate change, well, most of us know that climate change is real and it's happening. So in May of this year in Midland, Michigan, which is on the eastern part of the lower peninsula of this city, and it's about 100 miles north of Detroit, they had a 500 year rainfall that caused two dams to collapse. And it caused this flooding in a big extensive area. This is just one photo of damage. And by coincidence, a fellow from Eagle by the name of Luke Trumbull had inspected these two dams the last year or two and said they were safe. He was wrong. Luke also works in the, uh, the mine permit process and he was involved in the dam safety permit that uh, Eagle had submitted earlier. So we have concerns about his skill set and knowledge about what tailing dams uh, need and can do. So we wrote a letter to him, a copy to a bunch of legislators and other politicians and other individuals that are relevant to this case and said, here's the problem. If you can't take steel and concrete and build a dam that's safe and gonna last for a 500 year uh, rain event, how are you going to take excavated ore and tailings materials? And the tailings materials come out when they process this this ore is pulverized to the consist consistency of fine beach sand. How are you gonna take that material and make a dam that's going to be there forever? And forever is a long time, as you know. So we've been educating the uh, state of Michigan about these issues. Next issue, uh, next slide. Uh, in April of this year, the American Rivers Group, which you've probably heard about, included the Menominee River in one of its most endangered river listings for 2020. And again, the threat is because of mining. This is the second time American Rivers has included the Menominee River in their uh, listing. The first time was in 2017. So it's got national recognition this way. And it also got some national recognition uh, late last year in a print version of the something called the Drake Magazine, if you've seen it or know about it. There was an article in there that included a description of the mining issue and the problems it could have. Next slide. This is what we wanna protect. For those of you that may know him, that's Harry Blessing making the cast on a perfect day on the uh, Menominee River. And that's Ham Nelson, who's a fishing guide out of a tight line shop up in the Green Bay area. This is what we want to protect. So we need help in doing this from everybody, including the Lee Wolf chapter and its members and anybody else they know that wants to join this opposition to this program. You've supported the coalition over time and we appreciate that. And so I have a special request today. In addition to what you've done, and hopefully you'll continue supporting this coalition, uh, I have this idea that somewhere you, your members know somebody or a company that would like to be really generous and make a donation to the coalition to protect the Menominee River. If you know this person or this company, give me the contact information and I'll follow up and pursue this idea. I'm just kind of, this is sort of a dreamy thought because uh, we received a donation out of the blue two or three weeks ago. It came from an estate of somebody and this was all managed by an endowment fund company. 
And it was just kind of flabbergasting that all of a sudden out of nowhere, and this was fairly substantial. So we're pretty appreciative. So we've got this idea now that maybe you and I know somebody that would like to do this. That's my show and tell. Thank you for your help. Thank you for the invitation to talk to you. Now, give me your questions and let's talk. Everybody will have to unmute to ask your question, so go right ahead. Jerry, I, I, I have a comment, if, if I can make it. To sure. Dick. Dick, when you start looking for funds, uh, it wouldn't hurt to go to a state lawyer. You know, these guys get huge amounts uh and they are often do things that have nothing to do with the estate itself just things they're interested in so uh you know you might get some of your friends in the bar to talk to these guys and say uh who's handling the estates go talk to those fellas and i think you might be surprised at what would happen terrific idea thank you i'll i'll follow up on that hey, Dick, um what what gave them the impetus to come and dig the mine in this particular location? Did they do a lot of research as, I mean, why that spot on the river? So interesting little story. So somewhere around 2000 or thereabouts, uh, a fellow by the name of Tom Quigley bought a 40 acre site that he was going to build a cabin on it. In order to have the cabin, he needed water. So he called in the water driller and they drilled the holes, they did some borings to find out where the water might be for this water well. And Tom and a friend of his that teaches up at Michigan Tech, which is up in Marquette, uh, have a science background. And he says, well, let me see these borings. So they looked at the borings and they saw signs of minerals of gold, silver, copper, lead, or zinc, or whatever they saw at the time. And as they says, holy smokes, I could maybe retire with all this money. And so the, it evolved from their little research like that. And they started growing and growing over time until they got to where they are now. And in the meantime, so they've done more borings, they've done I don't know, probably 100, 150 borings, so they can sort of calculate, not sort of, but actually calculate how much mineral is in this land. So they, if you look at their financial statements and their investor reports, they'll tell you how many ounces of gold they expect to get, how many pounds of lead, all that kind of stuff there. So there's details. So they've done extensive analysis, and this has been expensive. They've spent close to $100 million doing this and they've had nothing come out of it. Now they've got some shortfalls in cash, so uh, we may be ahead of the game and they may not be able to pursue this. So that's kind of the, the beginning of time story there. Hey, Dick. Yes. In, in the beginning on one of the first slides, it looked like there were several cultural sites that are on there. Uh, that's correct. And, are, are not the tribal people involved too in trying to stop it to protect those things? The Menominee River, the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin, which is headquartered in Kashina, which is about 100 miles, maybe 75 miles, would be southwest of there, yeah, they basically uh, is involved. actively involved. Is actively involved in this, as I mentioned, they're part of that lawsuit that we had on the, the contested hearing about the wetlands permit. But there are numerous uh, historic artifacts uh, from the Menominee and, and this is the like the birthplace of the Menominee Indian tribe. If you look around, you can see the name of the city is Menominee, the Menominee River like that, there's a county called Menominee, and there's a whole bunch of stuff like that that uh, they want to protect also. So and that shows their interest again from the beginning of time. If actually back to this, this area of concern thing with the EPA, part of that uh, reconstruction was to fix up a, a wetlands in the shoreline of Lake Michigan there so they could plant rice again. And uh, rice was a big thing that they wanted. Does that answer your question there or give you some? 
Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if they were active in, in going to these hearings and these meetings to, you know, protest it from their yep. culture. Very active. Very active. They've got a. Um, so they're here the, in uh, La Crosse. There's a fellow by the name of Al Gedix, a retired University of Wisconsin professor that's been working with the Menominee tribe for 25 years now, or something like this, in in this group that they've got there, and so. Al, Al Gedix is his name. And uh, so he's been active with them and with the coalition now. And he's a terrific writer and speaker. So he does presentations like this on a regular basis. And he writes articles that get published in the papers and shared with lots of people that way. So they are active, yes. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Dick? Jerry, I have one other comment thinking about that dam. Uh, we all have experience in Wisconsin about what happens on those small dams uh, let loose uh, all the cow mm -hmm. in our streams and kill everything. And you, you know, you don't have to, you don't, there are probably lots of examples about what happens and how quickly it happens. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> you mean, John, do you mean the, like, where the manure seeps out? Yes. That yeah. is that way? Or I would, could have been the retention ponds that broke and uh, kind of destroyed that uh, timber coulee area. Right, but it doesn't take years. much. It doesn't right. take much to destroy a facility, does it, Dick? Uh, no, it doesn't, no. And, and, you know, you have something that's much more substantial than that uh, up there in that mine. But yep. th those might be, I don't know whether they're useful examples or not, honestly. Well, uh, we hadn't thought about that. We'll, we'll discuss that and maybe there's a way of bringing that in. Let me go back to the tailings management facility for a moment. So this thing is on 124 acres. It'll be 140 feet high and it's designed to hold 4.9 million cubic meters of tailings materials. Now, I was in preparation for this, I was talking to myself. I says, what's an example of 4.9 cubic meters? Because none of us can picture that kind of stuff. So that would, if you put it all together and you made a cube, the cube would measure 557 feet on a side. So that's like a city block, you know, in size like that. The other comparison is uh, we've all heard and probably seen uh, Amazon warehouses, they build, they're building warehouses that are a million square feet floor level, and they're about 40 feet high. So uh, if you took four and a third of these warehouses, you could put that 4.9 million cubic meters inside of them. So but that's just quantity, but that's just little side light things. If, um, <laughs> If if when they, they they've mined it and they have their their tailings, wh where are they going to refine the ore at? Is it going to get shipped out of there, or are they going to refine it there also? Uh, both parts. They're gonna they're gonna capture the minerals on site, and the process there is they take the ore, they they excavate the ore, and then they pulverize it to the consistency of fine beach sand. And right. they, chemically, they treat it with cyanide and some other chemicals that I can't spell or pronounce. And, uh -huh. they, and they extract these five minerals they're looking for through that chemical process. And they supposedly clear up or take out some of these chemicals out of the tailings and store it there. After the, uh, or the, these five minerals, you got gold, silver, copper, lead, and zinc. And after these minerals are captured, uh, they're going to, they're, they have a, a facility there for the gold and the silver part at least, that's going to be heated up and it's going to form it into bars called DORE, D-O-R-E. And then, mm -hmm. the, and those aren't pure, so they ship them off to someplace else that reprocesses them and makes it into pure bars of gold. And then the other ores, the other minerals, I don't know the mechanics, I think they just extract them out there, put them on a truck and ship them off to someplace. So you're going to have a lot of heavy truck traffic too. And so a lot of those processes are going to require some 
large quantities of water. Do they have permits to get the water? Uh, they do, actually. And actually, there's enough, probably enough water that they'll find at the bottom of this open pit that they can extract and use for their processing. And supposedly, they're going to, with the excess water, they're going to, when they, let me back up. So when they process this with the chemical mixture, there's water in there. And then they uh, supposedly purify this water, and then they're going to dump it into the river. And they've got a permit to do that. It's called the NPDS, National Pollution Discharge something. And uh, so, but the, they've got that, but that's got qualifications too. So there's concerns, you know, like, are they going to pay attention? And one of the issues, another issue is that uh, mines operate 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no breaks, no nothing. So if you live or you're a tourist in the area, you're going to get affected by noise. Night At nighttime, you'll have light pollution. You're going to have dust all over the place and vibrations from blasting. So it's not going to be a pleasant site. And there are houses on both sides, north and south of the site, and across the river, there's a bigger development there. So these people are going to suffer a lot. Somebody else had a question there. I, I have another comment, Dick. Um, has the coalition talked to any of the people out in Anaconda about that tailing mess they've had for all the years and how it's that, that that's a major tailing conversation in the country led to lawsuits uh, uh, you know all sorts of stuff uh, that's I can't I can't think of a better tailing uh, proposition than Anaconda Montana uh, no, I don't think we've talked to that. The closest we've probably come to that is I mentioned this mining engineer, Dr. Chambers, is headquartered out in, I think he's in Bozeman. Yeah. And uh, so he's probably familiar with that. I'm sure he's familiar. He would, he would absolutely yeah. be familiar with that. Right. So no, we have not. And uh, But t tailings are a are big problem and mine pollution is really nasty. I just saw a report the other day is something to the effect of 27 billion gallons of water are contaminated every year from the mining, the leftover mine sites. And there's mine sites all over the country, much to my surprise. I always thought mining took place in Montana and out west like that. But uh, there's a lot of it in the upper peninsula of Michigan. So there's right now there's, in, in my perspective, a couple of mining issues. We've got this one here on the Menominee in Minnesota in the Boundary Waters area. They've got issues over there. And uh, I learned about a new one in uh, Wyoming that they want to build. And of course, the Pebble Mine in Alaska. So yeah. mining is good and mining is necessary, but I think it has to be in the right place, you know, just in, with the right people that might be able to minimize damage because we need all this stuff. And this, this is an open pit mine again? It'll be an open pit for five or six years, and then they want to do an underground portion of it for another six or seven years. Now, interestingly enough, their application is for an open pit, and that's what's been issued. The state, for reasons that we don't understand, refuses to recognize the underground portion of this, and it's maybe more of a technical thing in that the mining company hasn't asked for a permit for underground yet. But in all of the mining companies' literature and correspondence, they keep talking about this underground mine. And we need right. to get the state of Michigan to do this because all the calculations going into tailings, dams, and water, and all this kind of stuff is based on uh, this open pit. And uh, so this would increase the size substantially. So. And just so, and do you know the depth of the pit by chance? 750 feet. And are they going to be obligated to reclaim all the land once they've mined it out? Yes, they're supposed okay. to reclaim it and that somehow that hole will get filled and I don't know how that happens. And, but they can't use the tailings materials because they're all contaminated. And right. They want to keep it up there. Supposed it could be a deep water pond. <laughs> uh, it could be, but you could have seepage to or from the river from that, 
And then with all that sulfite exposed there, you're going to have more problems. Dick, thank you very much for uh, presenting this, and I certainly enjoyed it. I hope everybody else did, and we will keep our ears and eyes open for potential sources for funds. John, thank you for your suggestion. That was a good one. Mm -hmm. Yep, we will follow up on that one. I appreciate that, and thanks for the questions. Hey, Scott, can we have one more slide? Yes. I wanted you all to drool about this scene here versus when you get this next one here. <laughs> so this is my contact information. You can give me a call or send me an email anytime that fits your schedule. And so that email address is OBI, OBI, OBI. And do you know what an OB is? Maybe not. So you've, we've all seen pictures of Japanese women in their kimonos, those fancy gowns they wear. Well, the belt or the sash around there is an obi. And so in the beginning of time, I lived in Japan, compliments of the Navy. And so that's how this all evolved. There's a little more story to it, but that's it. Anyway, thank you very much for the opportunity. And thanks for all your help and support with the coalition. And, and Dick has sent us some thanks, information. Dick. Uh, along, and I'm going to have it posted uh, shortly after uh, tonight uh, on our website, I hope. And also, uh, I can give this out when I send it to you. All right. Uh, we'll get that going along. Terrific. Does anybody else have any discussion tonight? Anything else you have to add? A chance to didn't say hello to you yet, Denny. Hi, Denny. Uh, good to see you. Uh, I'm hoping that next month we have the meeting on the third Thursday. This time we had to change it because of the uh, style setting that uh, we set up, and it just landed on the wrong night. And so we will have it on the third Thursday of October. I hope to see you all then. And uh, stay safe, wear your mask, and uh, be good. So good, good night. Dad. Thank you, Dick. Good night, all. Thank you. Good night. Hey, Jenny, you want to meet Jerry and I down at South Platte tomorrow? What's that? I'm asking Denny if he wants to meet us on the South Platte. Yeah, come oh. on, dude. <laughs> Actually, I, I do have a uh, a commitment. I'm I'm going hiking with Pat tomorrow. It's it's our Friday thing. <laughs> Absolutely. What time did you say again? 8.30? 8.30 in Sedalia. Okay. I'll be there. I just wanted to make sure I didn't screw it up. You guys will be down by Sedalia? What's that? You'll be down by Sedalia? Yeah. Yeah, I'll be there. Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a haul for me. Yep. Bob, where, where are you fishing on the South Plant? <clears throat> down near Deckers. Okay, so below Cheeseman then? Yeah. Yeah. All right, fellas. Good to see all of you. Very good, John. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thanks again for hosting and getting us together. Uh, you're the glue that keeps everything going, and I really appreciate it. So, good night, all. I'm going to sign out, and Scott will turn us out, and have a safe weekend. Thanks. You too. Everybody enjoy.